Hello, and welcome back to Parlay. This one was paid for by Mr. Foot, the one and only. Uh, and it's about author-audience relationships. You may recall the Mr. Foot Parlay from May. Mr. Foot says, welcome back to Parlay. Back in May, we talked about the invisible wall and how it relates to the relationship between the author and the audience. This month, I would like to look at some examples. This is what we will be discussing and spoiling. Goodbye, Airy, which is a manga, ran 25 to 45 minutes. The Beginner's Guide, a game, very linear game that ran 65 to 100 minutes, and you really, again, it's extremely linear, you wouldn't take a different amount of time with it. Uh, it doesn't really have a challenge in a mechanical sense either, it's not that type of game. Uh, so you will finish it in around that much time. And The Rehearsal, it's a TV series that was around 200 minutes. Quick disclaimer, uh, normally that would be way too much material, way, well, that's like 10 parlays worth of stuff to cover, right? Normally I need to be able to cover the parlay content within the duration of the parlay. Uh, you want me to do 5-10 minutes of reading to set one up, that's totally cool, uh, but this much is way too much. Now I had already played the beginner's guide years ago for a previous uh, thing that we did, so you knew I'd already played that. And then Goodbye Airy, that's bite size. I would say that that's uh, sort of, you know, now and again, it's okay to say, you know, could you read this 15 minute thing that is available for free here? You know, something like that. And then I said that I was interested in the rehearsal in a discussion Mr. Foot and I had about this subject after the previous parlay and said I would be willing to watch that. Critically, and I do want to talk about this a little more in this parlay, but there's a lot to cover, so we'll see if we get to it. Uh, this is a topic for which you kind of need examples in a way I don't think you do most of the time. I uh, I mean, I'm the one who started doing parlay, so of course I would say this, but I'm big on the idea that people really overestimate the need for having experienced the thing themselves. Uh, I think that uh, maybe, sure, maybe a lot of people do, um, but I often find if I think about the thing before I've experienced it and then I experience it, the person had oversold how much you really needed an example of that thing uh, because that is how they experienced it. I don't think that's bad or ignorant of them. They just haven't had the experience of having thought that thought before having an example of it, right? But because they then give that idea to me, I have had the experience of thinking that thing before having an example. And so, yeah. Um, and maybe I'm just not that bad at this type of abstract thinking. I do this for a living, so I've gotten some practice from all of you. Um, however, I do think that this subject uniquely benefits from having examples, a lot of which is because there just aren't that many <laughs> examples. By the very nature of the topic, we're kind of pushing and aggressing the boundary between the author and the audience and the fourth wall and what is kind of acceptable to make in a piece of media. So. Uh, I, I'll get a little bit more, if I can, into exactly why examples of this feel so necessary, but a lot of them are because they kind of break into the real world a little bit. So just keep that in mind. We'll come back to at least that point a little bit. These get more and more hostile in that author-audience relationship as we go along. Goodbye, Ari, the beginner's guide, the rehearsal. Not sure I agree with that. We'll come back to it. I would like you to take a look at how they try to break that relationship, what they're trying to achieve by doing that, and whether they go too far by crossing the invisible wall, venturing into the realm of maybe this shouldn't have been created. And then following that, you did something uh, kind of unusual in Parlay. You gave a bunch of prompts, but you said, you know, you j just pick whichever ones you think are interesting or worth including. So I'll be including most, but not all, of those bullet points. There's about seven of them. I'm going to use uh, five or six. I, I mean, I read them all. I just, some of them, I, I think, with limited time. It's better to prioritize these. Well, let's talk about them kind of in order, and you have kind of ordered the bullet points in order. And we'll use this as a way to kind of anchor the audience for uh, what we mean by a piece of work that is kind of aggressing the author-audience relationship. We'll start with Goodbye, Airy. Um, you said, uh, a story about a story, Goodbye, Airy, isn't a particularly innovative concept. By itself, Goodbye, Airy is good, but maybe not that remarkable. If you view it as a follow-up to Look Back, which is a, a, a previous manga um, about a mangaka that many people took to be autobiographical, like the person was writing about themselves, then Goodbye Airy seems to be both stubborn and almost spiteful, which is what makes it interesting to Mr. Foot. Um, I, I understand that reading. Um, I am a very anti-metatext reader. Um, I generally don't do 
much research in pieces before I consume them. Uh, I believe strongly philosophically that it should stand alone. Like if what makes something interesting is something that isn't a part of the text, then that isn't a part of the text. <laughs> um, and so generally, I'm just not interested in something that requires outside materials to be enjoyable. Um, one of the reasons I feel that way is that I feel that uh, high art <laughs> or just like deep enjoyment of things in life doesn't require that. There's simply no need for a piece to require outside information to be deeply enjoyable in a complex, not surface level way. People act like only the refined art is, you know, really, really good. And so those advanced pieces require some outside education, but they just don't though, according to me. <laughs> um, there are very, very deep pieces of work that simply don't require extra information. And so why would it be good if they just did require extra information? But this is a comment about how knowing that there's another piece out there changes the text a little bit. And indeed, to me, when you mention that detail, it seems like Goodbye Airy might have been written as kind of a response. Let me explain why. So Look Back, yeah, is a story about a mangaka, um, you know, drawn by a mangaka. Um, and then Goodbye Airy is a story about making movies that only include uh, very subjective slices of the topic they're about. So a big early point in Goodbye Airy, last call for spoilers, you could go consume this media and then come back to this part later if you want. It'll be here. Anyway, uh, there's a movie at the beginning of Goodbye Airy that is about the main, I guess, focus character's mother. She was going to die of a terminal illness, and she said, I want you to film me a lot as I'm, you know, leaving this life. And he shows this movie at the school, and we see a bunch of details of uh, this this woman, his mom's life, and then when she's going to die, she says she wants him to film her death moment, <laughs> and he won't do it, and he runs away crying from the hospital, and then it explodes, like violently action movie explodes, um, and people say, how could you cut your mom's like death movie thing into a a movie with a cheap thrill and then show it at a school festival. Um, it's then revealed that this was only a very, very limited look at their relationship, and his mom was not very nice to him as they were, uh, you know, interacting over the, the later years of her life. She treated him like a camera person instead of like her child. Um, not very nice. And so that, that goes on to be the theme, as there is a few more nested stories within stories throughout the piece of work, uh, that, you know, you might be seeing this narrative presented. But it's not like, even if that is autobiographical, it's not like that means that's the whole story, ya idiot. And why would you say that? You can probably see where we're going now. Well, Look Back was his previous work about a mangaka, and may maybe a lot of people took that to be like, oh, this is your life story. And it's almost like Goodbye Area is saying, well, but that doesn't mean you know my life story. This is just a story version of my life. You see what I mean? I agree. It's that's and and that's kind of snarky in a way <laughs> that uh, that is uh, odd to me. Like that's that's a, a bit of a curveball. Um, there was, remember, I didn't know this when I read Goodbye Airy the first time, this, this reading this parlay was my first exposure to the idea that Look Back and Goodbye Airy are, um, paired in this way, like that suggestion is totally new to me. I read it and in, enjoyed it a lot, by the way, um, without that idea. I've been thinking that when you, when you write, there was something weird to me about that when I was reading it. There was a, mm, like a mood, I guess. And I think if you read Goodbye Airy, you will detect this a little bit, though it might be hard to pair that apart from what we've now told you about it. Um, there, the the tone, was it the tone? What was it about it? Like what what piece is in this? There was a there was a matter of factness. There was a way that the dialogue was delivered, which was a little bit, I don't know, glib or something almost as if it was kind of talking to the audience, or we were just sort of going through the motions as if the mangaka is saying, see, you didn't know everything about my previous work. I mean, we're totally talking about Goodbye Airy diegetically. Uh, 
but about my previous work. <laughs> uh, and I, I, so I get that. I, I feel like that has, that had a feel of there being some kind of, I'm talking to the audience thing going on. Uh, I think the, the, the note I have about the goodbye airy thing is that there's something weird going on with when you write a story that references the idea that it might be real events or that stories may be about real events. Writing a story like this kind of breaks your usual ability to do the death of the author thing which we've talked about a lot in Mr. Food Parlays already. Uh, your refresher is it's what it sounds like. Not reading a work and thinking, okay, what's the author's story? How is this autobiographical? No, no, no. The death of the author thing says, well, no, what is the story saying on its own merits? What's your interpretation? Once it's out there, it's not the author's thing anymore. It's yours to have your own experience of. I, uh, it has come up in many previous parlay. I'm a very strong proponent of this approach. Um, that spiel I said at the beginning of this parlay about how I think the works should stand alone without any additional meta text is essentially a different version of the death of the author philosophy. Um, I think that there are maybe even a more extreme version. Um, it's related to how I don't like contingent difficulty it's called, which itself is contingent difficulty, just like terms that you would need to know or references, almost like memes or in-jokes in a piece of literature or whatever. Uh, that you kind of need to know or it doesn't really work outside knowledge. Um, I think that the work should be r reasonably complete on its own or kind of fire by itself. It shouldn't require um, other stuff to do its thing. Um, which, by the way, I think Goodbye Airy, if anything, maybe is worse for me knowing this piece of information. So I'm not sure that it fails that test. I'm just saying that I think the idea that you would treat a piece of work like this stands alone, this doesn't mean anything else, this isn't the author talking to me, you, you can't really do that if the work is about not doing that. <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, it's very difficult for somebody to roll into a piece of media and say, I'm going to do my own thing. I don't care who this author was. I'm going to interpret it my own way. And then the topic of the work that you're supposedly not going to think about the author with is the author's relationship to the work. <laughs> you see what I mean? And so I feel like there's a way in which writing stories like this that kind of poke at the fourth wall does kind of break that ability for the story to just be interpreted on its own merits. You have to kind of be ignoring the story <laughs> to not begin to look at the author a little bit more, right? I couldn't help but think as I was reading Goodbye, Ari, um, and and even more look back because it's just obvious in that one uh this is a manga about a mangaka <laughs> so you can't really not think hmm i wonder if this is the story of how the mangaka became a mangaka hmm like that's not rocket science you see what i mean <laughs> of course and so i don't know i mean i think that um the 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 thing about goodbye airy as this starting example, our first of three examples. You said you think they're going to get more and more hostile, so this is the least hostile one. Yeah, because Goodbye Airy doesn't literally reference it being a real event. When we move on to the beginner's guide and the rehearsal, these are stories which maintain a facade that the events described are real in this world. They are much more like invisible theater We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, rather than Goodbye Airy, which is just a story about a world where there is a facade of the events being real, or they are real to some extent. They're an abridged version of reality. Goodbye Airy doesn't quite hit that fourth wall. It's just kind of leaning against it, maybe you'd say. Whereas when we get to the beginner's guide, I don't have too much about this one, but uh, I, I do think that's at the point where you can't really make that work without thinking... Mm -hmm. I am I am claiming that these events are real. You know, the either the the story is a lie, though I don't think I'd think of it as a lie exactly, but it either is or isn't a real event. In the beginner's guide, Davy our narrator, the game developer, says that the games we're seeing are games made by his friend, like actually, and that he is showing us them without his friend's permission and publishing them on steam for you to enjoy he says more or less exactly those words in the game the beginner's guide so that's either true or it isn't <laughs> you see what i meant in goodbye airy about 
you can't just not think about what the author is trying to say when the author literally says, hey, I'm the author, what's up, dude? <laughs> Here's this game that I'm putting on Steam, you know, that's from my friend. For, for the beginner's guide, I think we're going to use this as a bridge to a topic in the rehearsal I want to tackle, which is about how there's this weird kind of game of chicken that I always play with these pieces of work. Now remember, Death of the Author Man Zandy, you just can't with this kind of work, right? And so I, who normally doesn't really like interpreting that, I'm going to be tempted to find a way to kind of hand wave it. And this might be seen as a way to kind of hand wave, oh, you just don't have to worry about that. You know, the, the they can't possibly be real, is what I'm about to say. But of course it can, right? Just keep that in mind throughout this. Why can't it possibly be real? Well, in my mind, it's like, you literally just, do you hear what you're saying, Davey? You're, you're playing a character who is perfectly depicting how being ignorant of what you are doing is bad. It just kind of beggars belief that you could go through the motions of publishing a game about your friend's games without their permission and how that upset your friend when you looked at their games and showed people their games. It kind of beggars belief that you could have done all of that and it never once occurred to you that maybe people will be like upset that you did that. And by the very fact that it's just kind of impossible that people wouldn't think that, I feel like we know that it's not real to some extent, because it's just not possible that he didn't think that. And so what, if it's real, he deliberately, he's deliberately inviting bashing. He's like purposefully admitting not a crime, but like something he knows people will get mad at him for. Mr. Foot says, uh, to this day, people leave Steam reviews attacking Davy for selling out his friend. According to my research, Davy has never publicly commented on what parts of his game are real, what his reason for creating it was, or what it means. Uh, indeed, for that would reveal the facade. And doesn't it feel like that is exactly what you would do? if it was not real, and the point of it was to bring the audience's attention to that idea. You see what I mean? I don't know, it just seems like not fully possible that that could, that it just is real and he's doing all of that. But to, to devil's advocate for a moment, perhaps if you actually did do this thing, you would feel like it would give you a good alibi, not exactly, but it would kind of quash controversy in the future by revealing that you'd done it. Except that if you wanted to avoid controversy, you could just not do it. <laughs> you could just not publish the game. So to me, it feels like there's there's sort of, it's not really possible that this type of work can be real. It just sort of can't, categorically cannot be real. Uh, from a logistical perspective or from a psychological perspective not just because like what this is Davy interviewing himself you're telling me he didn't inject anything personal in there we'll come to that later in the rehearsal section but yeah i don't know i i um maybe i seem like no fun interpreting it this way but i i have a strong reaction when i consume these pieces of media i generally don't like them because i feel like there's there isn't any way to you know maintain a facade that the work could be real it's like no it's definitely not like if you're doing that there's no chance it is basically but maybe i have is it too much faith in people do i underestimate people which is it um and sure it could be real you know what i mean like what's it's not like someone physically couldn't possibly do it it just seems like it would be kind of I don't know, stupid <laughs> to me, like just bad. Or if you did do that, would you would you never ever comment on it ever? You know what I mean? I feel like that level of commitment is commitment to the piece of art which is not real and is trying to achieve that goal. I will I will <laughs> take a chill pill about this subject. I, I'm enthusiastic about it because I think this is an interesting subject, but not because I am at all wondering whether it is real or not. Um, more because there's this kind of weird, it like, by the very fact that you've left the question open, uh, that is the logic I am using to be, assure myself that it isn't real, um, which seems flawed, you know what I mean? Like, to, couldn't, couldn't it just be real though? And then you'd get, 
this isn't game theory against the developer, but like, couldn't you get blown out or whatever if they leveled you and duped your state of thinking by, you know, they knew you would think that it couldn't be real if they acted like it was maybe real, and so it actually is real, and then you were fooled. But I, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know. Uh, we're going to bridge to the rehearsal. Um, this is where you're beginning to see, as a little segue section, that having examples is kind of necessary for this topic because it heavily relies on the individual circumstances of each piece a bit. Uh, again, it being just a game about games. And, and so there's a catch because in the beginner's guide, right, there's nothing in that piece that, that directly flirts with the idea that it needs to be real if that makes sense. What I mean is, obviously Davy could easily have made the games in the Beginner's Guide himself. Like, logistically, there's really no reason he couldn't easily have constructed those things by himself. Whereas in the rehearsal, this is a live-action television series with real people, to some extent, really living their lives. And so there's a little bit more of an, a suggestion that it can't be, it can only be so fake. You know what I mean? They are literally real people. There are people there. The actors, you know, acting in the first place, it, which Davy is doing in the Beginner's Guide, but, you know, we're seeing their faces and they're moving around and stuff. We're in the real world, is I guess what I'm getting at. Not all of that can be fabricated by the television company. You see what I'm trying to say? Like, some of it is real. It's hard to say if the bar in episode one which Nathan Fielder, the main character slash director, but mm, we'll get back to that. It's hard to say if the bar in episode one that they reproduce flawlessly in episode one as part of the plot is like a real bar, but it almost certainly is. It just seems like here's another way that I always grapple with these is it real works. It just seems unnecessary, wasteful. This, this show has a budget for the bar to be fake, for the real bar to be fake. They make a recreation of the bar in a warehouse. And so, like, I guess you could make that with CG in post-production. Like, you could make it look like the real bar. The real bar. That's going to get confusing quickly. But you see what I'm trying to say. In a way that it doesn't apply to the beginner's guide, because of literally just, like, needing to pay for things, a show that is a live-action show feels like there's more of an impetus for things to be real if there's no reason they, like, couldn't be real. The, the default thing is that the thing is real. Whereas I, The Beginner's Guide is a video game. Somebody made these games, right? <laughs> uh, they're not, they can't be, like, real as in not manufactured for the purpose of the narrative. They were either manufactured for the, for, the, for, the, for the purpose of Davy's friend's narrative, or they were manufactured for the purpose of Davy's narrative. It's one or the other. They can't not be manufactured for the purpose of a narrative, or, you know, for one of those two people. Whereas the bar in the first episode of the rehearsal could literally be a bar that was not made for any reason relevant to this TV show. It could be. And that would be easier than if it wasn't, so it probably is as what I often think, because it would cost a lot of money if it wasn't. But then again, they do literally create the bar again in the show, the rehearsal. <laughs> Should probably explain what this is about, just in case people are getting confused, which I kind of am doing on purpose, but I don't want you to be that confused. Um, the rehearsal is about Nathan Fielder finding people who have something they want to tell someone and giving them help by incredibly elaborately recreating that moment in their life hiring actors that profile the person that they want to confess something to or the thing that they want to practice for. So in episode one, a character that they find, Kor, wants to tell his friend from Trivia Night that he's been lying about his educational history, and he's nervous about that. So they flawlessly recreate the bar that Kor wants to tell her this thing in. They have an actress play her so that he can rehearse telling her and also hire like 50 other actors to play everybody in the bar. And they also profile his real friend by having the actress that's going to pretend to be her pretend to be someone else and interview her in real life to like get her details and learn to copy her. Now remember, we don't have any way to know as the audience whether those people were, you know, candidly experiencing those things or not. It's, there's just not an easy way to know. 
it's possible that Kor was a guy that the film crew literally just dropped in on, and this was a surprise. Or it's possible that he was a hired actor that was told to play the role of someone who was like surprised and thought it was a weird idea but agreed to, right? Obviously, after he agreed to it, he had to have signed like a contract or something. But we we just we don't know that. Until I read Mr. Foot's parlay request, I had not even entertained the idea, because of what I've told you about myself for this parlay so far, that any of the events in the rehearsal were real or that there was even any genuine attempt to make it seem like they were not real um, or that they were real. Um, I'll read what Mr. Fu wrote. The real, not real thing is getting very overwhelming. Mr. Fu says, we know that there are parts of the rehearsal that are real uh, in the sense that they are real people participating in that show, as in not scripted actors. Core from the first episode and Angela from the second onward are as real as they get. I'm going to stop right here. Do we know that? Like, I, I can accept that you may be saying, like, there are interviews where they say those people were were not actors. You know, they were, I mean, they they were to some extent, right? Because if you're, you, they knew they were on camera. But what I mean is they weren't high, they weren't told to be pretending. Let's say it that way. There's a whole separate point here about, like, they can't really not be acting completely. Though, let's assume that we are all knowing and we know that that is true. Kor and Angela are are not acting. They were not paid to act. I would say that the way Kor behaves seems believable to me, whatever that means, as someone who really wasn't paid to act in that role. He seems to be acting the way I would largely expect someone to act in that situation. He's awkward an amount that is, if he is acting, truly masterful. Like, I, I, he, I would believe that he is really, like, a part of the show. Um, but when I watched the show, I didn't even entertain for a second the idea that they were actually coming into some random guy's house and saying, hey, we can help you confess the thing to this person in your life that you're having trouble saying it to, for a variety of reasons. The first one is that logistically, something doesn't add up. And this is the part where Zandi is no fun. How would you find people who needed this done? Like that just doesn't, I think they cover that a little bit. Uh, they put out like a Craigslist stat or something, you know, do you need to confess a thing um, to find people for the show? Uh, if they really did do that, that is quite fascinating in and of itself, by the way, <laughs> um, how that, how they even found people that wanted to do that. Um, to that level of like nearly breaking the law level transgression and replicating reality, right? But I just don't think they did. Um, I, I don't think it's because the actors, if they are actors, were not believable in their roles. Like here's another example. Angela uh, wants to rehearse having a child. And so a big subplot of the show is how, how that long rehearsal goes. They make her, a, you know, Get, they get a house to simulate the type of house she would be in, and someone simulates being her spouse. That's a whole subplot, uh, looking for someone for her to actually date. But then Nathan Fielder ends up playing her spouse uh, for a little while, and then she leaves that scenario, but he keeps doing it, and then that becomes this whole thing. But the point is, uh, Angela behaves in some ways in the kind of simulating being a parent part where it's a plot in the show that she's like not taking it that seriously and they have camera footage of her because she knows there are cameras in the house all over the house and so they have camera footage of her like goofing off and stuff and not really doing the rehearsal thing that much just kind of having a vacation in her dream home they literally say exactly that it kind of seems like you're not taking this that seriously of course she gets very upset because of course she would now that doesn't just automatically mean it's fake Right, that's an incredibly surface level way to think of that. I absolutely believe that if you got a real person to do this, they would do that, even though they should know that there are cameras recording them and therefore they're busted. Like, that's very believable to me as something that somebody would really do. It's not because of that. It's just because I I feel like it's too the the way the narrative is presented feels a little bit too I don't know. It just feels like things happened a little too well for the story that was told. Maybe that's just incredibly good editing. I have very little experience watching like live TV 
Uh, and so perhaps I'm just not acclimated to like the type of thing that happens in these shows or something. That's absolutely a valid interpretation. But remember, the reason I'm, I'm getting hung up on whether it's real or not, because I think that's of note for this subject. But remember that the topic we're, we're meant to get back to here is the idea that the, the show is kind of pushing the boundaries of what's real. Now, why does it matter? Well, it matters because if the show is all fake, then there is no real harm, of course. That's why. <laughs> Maybe that was obvious this whole time. But toward the end of the rehearsal, the, the kind of key moment is Mr. Fruit interrogates a few of the points. The rehearsal was the original inspiration for this request. What, do you, what you take away from the story very much depends on what parts you think are real. Is Nathan Fielder playing his real-life self? Are the rehearsals shown in the show events that actually played out in full, or are they just story elements slash scenes that drive the narrative? Did they plan for Nathan to join Angela's rehearsal, and did they plan for her to leave, or was that by accident? Are the things that happened with Remy in the final episode genuine, or is he a really good child actor? Does our enjoyment of entertainment even depend on how real it is? I could go on and on. None of these answers are straightforward. I've watched the entire series three times, and I've come to different conclusions regarding what it's about in each viewing. Remy in the final episode. One of the kids that plays one of Angela's children for that rehearsal gets attached to Nathan, who comes to play Angela's spouse in that rehearsal. As if Nathan Fielder, the focus character and director of the show, and like that's his name in real life, is his real father, even though the kid has had it made clear to him that Nathan Fielder is not his real father, they're acting, they're pretending. And his mom, you know, presented as his real mother, says, you know, I felt like he understood what acting was, but he, he keeps, he won't call you Nathan, he keeps calling you dad or daddy instead. And the kid is like six or whatever. And the kid is like six or whatever. So you can start to say things that we're not going to get into because I've covered this subject probably more than Mr. Fu wanted already about, you know, could he even be that good at acting when he's that young that he's pretending? But the key thing is, if that is real, you could then begin to argue that the rehearsal did real harm. They portrayed events that were stressing someone out in the future so, so thoroughly that they actually caused new stress, <laughs> new anxiety to new people that were not supposed to be related to the subject in the effort to relieve someone of some stress. Personally, I despised Angela, and I find the type of people that Angela is extremely frustrating. Uh, and so I suppose you could say that I felt like, wow, well, if Remy got really upset, Angela r relieving some stress isn't worth it. She doesn't deserve, she doesn't need any stress relieved. No one deserves anything, but uh, she doesn't need that benefit, especially if the cost is this kid being distressed, right? Like that just seems wrong. Like that's not good. <laughs> and of course, a big thread in the rehearsal, this is kind of obvious, which is why I haven't gone on it for a long time, is this underlying thread that the rehearsals are perhaps actually more stressful than if the person had just confronted the problem. Uh, that perhaps the rehearsal draws up the catastrophizing that we all do and makes it feel like, oh, everything is gonna go terribly, I gotta have a million contingency plans, when really it's okay to just tell the person what's upsetting you. In the very first episode, when Kor confesses this thing to his friend in the, in the, uh, in the trivia group, she is like by far the most positive of all the possibilities they entertained. Like she's way less upset than anything they rehearsed. They rehearsed by comparison. It comes to seem like nightmare scenarios of things going badly and put far, far more effort into making things go well than was even remotely necessary. And that's, I think, meant to be the point of that one. Um, it just isn't needed to rehearse that much. It's okay for things to not go perfectly. Things can just be awkward. Um, I would venture a guess that my own anxiety, I wouldn't have said it was anxiety, 
But look how much I'm focusing on whether or not it's real in these discussions. Perhaps I care more about that than I thought I did. And we only know that because I don't script these because I can't. It would take too much time. Uh, I do too many of these. So you can be sure that none of the parlays are scripted because, uh, first of all, that would just be sad if I can't script things better. <laughs> um, and second of all, it's just not possible to have enough time to do them this frequently if you wrote, you know, hours of scripting for these often, you know, 40 plus minute videos, right? Um, that's just not possible. There isn't enough time in the day. I wouldn't be able to do anything else that I do other things uh, that you see as videos. Of course, there's no foot, there's no suggestion that these are scripted. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that perhaps <laughs> I care more about whether it's real than I think I do. I have been saying, oh, well, there's just no way it's real. It's like, all right, Sandy, but what if it is? You know, what what's what if you have to grapple with whether it is? Here's my thing. So the, the kind of penultimate question here is we've uncovered this idea that there there could be real harm done by these pieces of work from harm that I'm uh, sure it's the end of the world where the mangaka doesn't like how people interpreted their previous work and so they make a snarky reply with goodbye Eri to yeah this guy almost certainly didn't steal his friend's games and put them on steam but we don't know he didn't uh, in the beginner's guide to the rehearsal where we may see that a child became convinced that somebody was his real dad that he then had to be forcibly parted from at the end uh, because they were trying to relieve the anxiety of let's just say someone who maybe it's not as important uh, as this child having like a good young life where he's not convinced someone is his father um, i don't think angela angela's mental well-being uh if you can call it that, is worth this child's distress. So the suggestion in, in mind is, well, does that mean that this was too far to go for a TV show? Or the beginner's guide, the question seems more weird, but was that too far to go for a piece of entertainment? It More and more by comparison, you can see how I don't think it makes any sense that the beginner's guide is real, quote unquote. Uh, Mr. Fruit says, assuming that the rehearsal is not all fake, the show reminds me of a line from the beginner's guide. It's from the narrator, Davy Reedon, regarding the lowest point of Coda, the, his friend who he took the games from, supposedly, Coda's depression. Davy Reedon says, I hated seeing him so trapped. Video games are not worth this amount of suffering. The art we find here is very compelling, at least to me, but is this perhaps the edge of the invisible wall we were looking for? Yes, in your May parlay, we talked about how the creator of Nier Automata was discussing this kind of invisible barrier where you could make video games or whatever piece of art that featured those topics, but there is some problem beyond logistical why we do not make them. And basically, the problems are kind of moral. You know, there's some problem on a human level with making that piece of media. Simulating reality as thoroughly as they do in the rehearsal has consequences that are simply not worth the human cost of doing so. Having actors enter that level of immersion where they're meant to be in a real life scenario is just not worth the distress that it can cause. It's not going to alleviate enough upsetness for like the subject to be worth what it does to the participants would, would be the suggestion or seeing behind the scenes of Davy and Coda's situation isn't worth the disrespect, I, I'm not sure how to say it, not a huge deal for this situation, um, that the Beginner's Guide presents, right? Like, we, we feel as humans that maybe Coda's work should be given more respect and privacy. And so even though it's pretty interesting, it's just not worth that. Uh, again, the cost is a little weird in the Beginner's Guide. Like, why is it a problem to depict that? Um, Maybe it isn't. It's really only the rehearsal that gets close enough to actually causing very tangible, real, identifiable harm that a lot of people, I think most people watching it, if you said, do you think this is worth the cost, they would know what you meant, you know? A lot of people who play the beginner's guide, I hope, uh, would respond by saying, well, because it isn't real, I'm not as worried about that subject. Though there are clearly people who are worried about that subject with the beginner's guide. You get what I mean. 
Um, and so these are pieces of work that kind of brush up against that. Here is my issue. I thought this was all very interesting, having real examples of this, and especially the way Mr. Fruit did it, where there was kind of a gradient of like how, not real, but how tangible or identifiable the harm was, was really useful. And we've led right up to one where I think the rehearsal is a great example of something where I, ju I just don't know how to make the call on whether that, if it was real, is that too harmful for it to exist or not? I think my personal problem is that I already think a lot of art that most people don't think isn't worth it, isn't worth it. I already think most art <laughs> isn't worth the suffering it caused. I already think that the way a lot of people make media or like just things in their lives, create things, involves too much self-destruction to be worth the product. I feel like people don't enough pursue a path toward things being entertaining that isn't harmful, basically, to the, mostly to themselves or to the people involved. There's definitely a way to interpret uh, the rehearsal and the harm done in the rehearsal to Nathan, for example. Like, he's distressed for participating in the rehearsals, but there's a way to interpret that where you say, well, but it's him. He did it to himself, and so that's okay if he wants to choose that. Like, I don't really agree with this, but like we say, people are allowed to, you know, choose things that are unhealthy. You can eat unhealthy or drink too much a lot if you don't break any laws or something, um, you know, stuff like that, right? We Generally, most societies have agreed that you're allowed to do that. You Part of freedom in the United States, I love to quip, is that you're free to be wrong, uh, that's most of the freedom you're provided, actually, because what would be a good course of action is usually not much in question. What you're really allowed to do is make a stupid decision instead if you want. Uh, you sh really shouldn't, but you can if you want to. Um, if you don't want to make a stupid decision, freedom is m significantly less useful, <laughs> let's say it that way. Um, the problem, then, in the rehearsal is that the 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 six-year-old child doesn't feel like they are qualified to make that sacrifice. You see what I mean? That feels wrong to me a lot of the time in some way. But we have to draw some line where humans are not literally instantly able to consent responsibly and in, provide informed consent to any sacrifice. Like that just clearly there is some experience needed for you to say, you know, I'm going to distress myself, but it's like worth it though, because X, Y, and Z. And I, I would venture that most people agree that being six years old usually isn't like long enough alive to make informed consent to do that. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not sure I agree with that, actually. But again, it doesn't matter for me because I already think that most art is causing too much suffering for what it's worth. <laughs> um, so it, this that's beside the point, but uh, as a separate subject. Um, I don't want to get hung up on that too much. I don't want you to get hung up on that too much, audience member, thinking about this. Uh, you know, is the, the kid, you know, young or old enough to make informed consent about that? Um, yeah, that prevents you from hand-waving the issue. Like, I think it was wise to choose a child if, it, if that is fake. It was wise to have it be a child that's distressed so the audience can't just wipe the problem away by saying, oh you know, but they, they did, they signed up for that. And so it's okay if they're depressed or whatever. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I think that the, a, a big issue for me, in other words, is that I feel like a lot of these pieces of work sort of could be okay. Uh, it's sort of just a, like you could do the rehearsal, but take more care to not harm anyone. And then the problem just kind of disappears, and it feels like you actually kind of don't need to brush up against that invisible wall of what's acceptable to make that. It's just that they didn't try to avoid that very strongly, or artists, according to me, artists broadly, don't heavily enough value their own well-being, and therefore this is a problem. But it would be way less of a problem if they just properly did value their own well-being, but they just don't, and so it's more of an issue. Then you could turn around and say, well, okay, but then if you wanted to depict it with children, then there you go, you're right up against the invisible wall. But my point is just that the area where things are not okay is maybe smaller in reality than it appears. 
and people maybe just don't do it enough for it to be taken as as seriously or done with as much gravity as it would need to be for that to not harm people. You could do a lot more of that kind of thing, but people don't, and so maybe we don't have a good enough discourse for how to do it without hurting people, <laughs> causing harm. Um, one example that was given in the May one by the Nier Automata director um, was about sexy stuff. I, I think that was that briefly came up, which I actually think is a fairly good example for this subject. Um, at this moment in history, in some parts of the world, including where I live, sex and porn is being uh, destigmatized a, a little. It's pretty awkward going, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but is um, I, I think the trend is that people are learning to accept that a lot more, one way or another. That it's just sort of okay for people to express themselves a bit more sexually. That's not lowly or undeserving of respect uh, in the way that people have treated it in the past. And sexy or porny artists, uh, whether you know with their own bodies or by drawing stuff or whatever, are being treated as more legitimate than before, which uh, this is not neither here nor there, but I think is a good thing. Um, I think that it's that's a net good. Um, but my point is that that's an example of a subject where uh, the the perceived harm in the that invisible wall area, where maybe you can't do these things for moral reasons is it's different than my issue before where maybe people need to be more careful and then it wouldn't be harmful. This is one where the harm is highly subjective in the first place. You see what I mean? To depict a lot more sex is just subjectively harmful from the beginning. Like that isn't necessarily harmful in an intractable way. We could just think of things significantly differently. We can't just snap our fingers and do that, but it's very possible for that to just be recontextualized and then it just isn't that harmful. For me, the question is, what are the things in that invisible area where making a piece of art is harmful in some way, but we can't relatively easily just learn to make it much less harmful? What are the things that no matter what, it is harmful to do that that thing, right? Like, for example, without fundamentally changing humanity, we likely can't make the situation that Remy is in, in the rehearsal, where he's six years old and has to pretend to be someone's child when he lost his real dad. I didn't include that detail. I don't think it's entirely necessary. Um, I don't think without significantly changing the nature of humanity, we can make that consistently not harmful. It just doesn't really seem possible. There doesn't seem to be any combination of actions we can take within reason without totally transforming the foundations of society that will make it not, or maybe risky is the word I should use, to have a six-year-old child portray that scenario. That just seems like it's probably not the best idea for the foreseeable future. Whereas doing that with uh, older folks, we could heavily mitigate the harm relatively easily. That's the point I'm trying to make. And then I feel like the invisible wall covering those things really isn't that meaningful. Same thing with like a lot of sex media. Um, you could argue that really isn't that meaningful. Um, I'll give you a quick example of the sex media thing, actually, because I feel like that might be a bit too vague for some people. Um, I think the, the one I would use is, what do people call this? Minor coding, maybe people call it that. Uh, this is the phenomenon where uh, a character in a piece of media is portrayed as being generally just short or like physically small, uh, and therefore they're automatically considered to be a minor. Uh, this is a complicated one that deserves its own topic, but just to give you a few examples of when this comes up, uh, sometimes it'll be that the, not specific examples, but the character is said in the piece of work to be very old. They are old. They, they're, they are very clearly defined to be like a legal adult in the context of the world they live in. They run a business or are like super old, like a deity or something. They are very clearly very old. They don't act young. They act old. They speak in a way that sounds like they're an adult. Everything about them they are an adult, like there's really no question, except that they are physically small relative to like the other people in the piece of media. These might be real people, or they might be, uh, you know, animated, digital, drawn characters, whatever it is. Or it might even just be somebody written in a, in a book. 
uh, in text. This phenomenon is that people tend to immediately code those characters as being children, even though they are. There's really no clear reason to do that. Like that it seems like just a lack of exposure to adult short people. I I don't know that I'm not here to explain why that happens, but people do this a lot. Um, that might seem over long-winded to explain, but I'm sure you can think of examples of experiencing this yourself. Again, this subject is actually quite a bit more complicated. Uh, the the complicated bit we're not going to get into now, but I'm going to acknowledge just to clarify, to maybe get that out of the way, is that a lot of the time the marketing will flirt with the idea that maybe some people would like it would appeal to them to have these people not be uh, adults to be minor coded, um, and so they on purpose encourage maybe the voice actor to sound a bit maybe you could interpret it as childish even though a lot of what they're doing is still fairly objectively adult mannerism again on purpose so that people who uh, like are badly attracted to children like will like that that is bad and a problem and a whole complicated discussion that we're not going to have right now but my point is that that's very tractable like if society was just full of this people would just have to get to grips with the fact that it just doesn't from a pattern recognition perspective you, people simply wouldn't register people that are shorter as being young that just wouldn't be a relevant association if it if it was more prevalent basically um that wouldn't make any sense it just wouldn't make sense um i I'm going to say something a little <laughs> snarky about myself. Um, I'm 30, and I look a lot younger than 30 to a lot of people. I think because most people uh, in the part of the world I live in are not as healthy as I am, because they're not as fortunate as I am, and it's hard to be healthy. Uh, and they, you know, haven't taken as good care of their appearance or their, their themselves. Um, and so it is not common in some of the places I've lived, for people my age to look at all as youthful to some people as I do. Therefore, I am frequently treated like uh, like an older teenager. Um, that happens pretty often. Plenty of older teenage guys in my part of the world are my height and size, so that part kind of tracks. Like, to people, that just seems normal. I very often have the experience, for example, that I go into like a dentist office or something and i get treated just like i did when i was 15 until they look at my you know information thing on the computer screen and then their behavior suddenly changes and they treat me like an adult um, again this is fine what counts as being treated like a child is subjective too right but my point is that their behavior significantly changes around when they would have looked at my age which is telling and I think that the reason is simply that they just haven't been exposed to that many people who look, who are 30, but who look similar to me. And if they were, they wouldn't do that. They just wouldn't assume that. Um, you would be able to portray people of a wider range of body types, we'll put it that way, um, as being in like sexual situations without people freaking out about it as much if that happened more. Like, there's nothing that categorically makes it impossible for that to occur. If you summed up all of the sexual interactions that all humans have, there are numerically plenty that are happening between perfectly consenting adults, but that just would be perceived as young people by a lot of the population. And if people got used to the idea that you can't judge a book by its cover that way, that problem would largely evaporate, is the example I'm trying to give. Again, this is only to give two examples of how perception of, you know, what is a problem can kind of erode that invisible wall a little bit. And those things are, are some of them, harmful not because there's something about the nature of humans at the moment that make it harmful, but simply because there's some very, very changeable aspect of our perception that currently means it's harmful to depict things that way. Like, you wouldn't want to depict people that a lot of the audience would interpret as underage committing sexual acts and then say that that's fine because a lot of people would get the idea that you were saying that a lot of non-consensual underage sex is okay, which it isn't, right? But why are people coding those people as being underage? You see what I'm trying to say? So 
That's just an example. That's an example of something that you can imagine if you saw a piece of media like that right now, you would, with no further comments, you would go, <laughs> oh, and I would, I too would say, maybe that's not okay because the you haven't explained the proper subtext for the audience to understand that you're not enabling people to X, Y, and Z. And maybe you'd argue it does anyway. That's a separate issue too. But my point is that that would dramatically change depending on a rather small change in our perception of our of the culture we live in. Uh, whereas some of these things really wouldn't change how harmful they were based on our simple perception of the culture we live in. We would need to do, uh, I guess, some science or something to make it so people who are six years old pretending someone is their real father won't cause any psychological harm reliably. You see what I'm trying to say? Whereas by comparison, it would be rather easy to create a situation in modern society where we didn't perceive like short people being sexual as being automatically harmful um that's kind of unfair to those people um but you see what i'm trying to say like both require work but one of them is is an order of magnitude easier in a way that i feel like is th that quantity becomes quality uh there is something that is is now different about that woo a super long one i think i was able to make the point uh, that I took away from the rehearsal, which was a, a, a re-perception of what is harmful about making this type of work, a new understanding of the fact that, to me, it really isn't so different from when an artist invests like a lot of time, a lot of themselves, into making something. And the problem is really more with uh, consent on the surface level. Uh, and also with our perception that a lot of the things that we might perceive as being too harmful are really a matter of context and understanding, but some of them are not a matter of that. Some of them, it feels like there really is no removing this without a significant change to humanity. Fascinating. Uh, I definitely will not think of works like this the same way ever again. Uh, that is weird to me. Um, I do still personally strongly take away that these are mostly fabricated pieces. Like we talked earlier about how uh, Mr. Fruit said, uh, we know that there are parts of the rehearsal that are real in the sense that they're real people participating in the show, as in not scripted actors, Core from the first episode and Angela from the second onwards. Unless the production company was legally bound to tell the truth and said those people are real actors, I still, like, to me, that still isn't real. Like, to as far as my mind is concerned, I'm still convinced those people are actors. Um, because I I guess I'm just convinced everyone's an actor. And that's probably just me not watching enough reality TV or something. But a point I wanted to make more, and I just don't think it adds much at this point, but I just thought I'd bring it up again, is this idea that people being on camera is going to change their behavior. Like, I think with Angela, you saw a lot of her in her parenting role doubling down on things in a way perhaps she wouldn't have said it that way and been so adamantly positive, like toxically positive, if she were not on camera. I, I highly suspect that she would be way less pleasant about a lot of that stuff if you found her in actual private, but because she was always on camera, she framed things with this extreme, very fake positivity uh, that is is common in in people like that, uh, probably because she was on camera. And so I think it's critical to remind yourself that even if those people are for sure, they, they're legally required to admit that those people were definitely not paid actors, that doesn't mean that they weren't kind of acting in a way and that that is not necessarily how they really were. Though I think Kor, the guy from the first episode who wanted to confess this thing in the bar, he probably was acting quite similar to how he would really act in my very subjective interpretation. Um, I just feel like there are some things in the show that really feel like people acting like you would act differently if you were on camera but were not a paid actor, or acting that way because they're not a paid actor. Um, I don't think that, that you can, really, without breaking the law and filming people without their consent, get someone's actual, you know, there there is no not acting, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> um, which weirdly modifies the harm, in my opinion, because it means that if anything going on here harms the people who are not hired actors, well, but they are still not fully themselves, so I'm not sure what to do with that. 
I don't know. Uh, this was a fun one. Thanks for asking. I uh, look forward to seeing how you followed this one up.